Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are still at COFES, the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software for our second annual partnership with them. We are now sitting down with Dr. Robert Graber. Hello. Hi. Thanks for coming on to the show. Really appreciate it. Very excited. Are you coming here all the way from Germany? Yes. Yes. Um, well, headquarters in Germany. Um, but you know, I have a history um, in the in the Bay Area, so I love always coming back here. Yes, we the Bay Area loves Germany. We love you very much. We love CAD very much, which is a lot of what you're focused on right now. Also focused on building surveying, so we'll be talking about that too. Sure. Robert's background is very interesting. He's now been 18 years as the CTO at Graybert. Also, prior to that, did his PhD in civil and environmental engineering at Stanford, doing energy management and commercial real estate and impacts on building energy performance. So let's talk about this on a on a on your journey perspective. So okay. you know, how how did this all? How did your interest even in this engineering and software get started? Sure. So I think even from a young age, was always interested in computers, uh, you know, gaming, and but also trying to figure out how everything worked. Um, my father actually was um, one of the very so very first entrepreneurs in the sort of computing time. So he, that was always sort of a role model for me. Um, I basically did high school in Germany, but left to go to the UK um, when I was 16. I finished my high school there, and then so the natural progression was to kind of do, uh, go for an engineering or computing degree uh, in London. And so that's what I did. I ended up doing a four-year degree and a master. Um, as part of that, uh, my interest got sparked in mobile devices. So this is pre-iPhone, pre-Android, the Windows Phone was just starting at that time. This is in 2000 or 1999. And um, I was interested in saying, is it possible to bring engineering software, which was you know, what we had worked on in the company or my father's business, um, would it be possible to have that work on mobile, right? And so I um, took that on as a challenge and part of my sort of final year project was doing real-time graphics on mobile devices and then seeing can we take that even further and bring on a full CAD system onto mobile. And this is sort of my first real sort of software project was a um, uh, CATS product. And you mentioned building surveying. Um, one of the questions we asked ourselves, why would you want to do a CAD on mobile, right? Mm -hmm. Viewing, you could even use a PDF or something simple for that. Why would you want to have access to the full CAD system? And so we realized um, a lot of the, the jobs in which we actually consume CAD or create CAD have to do with the physical world, right? Whether that's in uh, an AEC when you actually, you know, you have physical spaces that we're designing here. so. Um, or it's on the, on the shop floor when you're actually making the product. And so we realized there's no real point in doing an architectural design package in the field, but doing a surveying package makes a lot of sense because now you're recreating the geometry from what's actually in the physical world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you're, when you're finding yourself getting first uh, involved in engineering, your father is obviously this big role model for sure. you getting, getting involved. And then you're, you're starting to figure out that yeah, you're you're kind of trying to position yourself somewhere within CAD, making it applicable to, for real world scenarios like you know building surveying, making it easier for you said to have CAD on mobile. Yes, and this is somewhere where I don't think I've really heard this quite yet. Yeah, CAD on on a on a mobile device versus on your desktop or laptop. Yeah, what? Keep, I mean, I want to. I want to hear more about the reasons behind that. But I want to also um, have you explain post. Was this? This was at London when this was happening. So, so this is sort of uh, at the tail end of my um, uh, my degree. I was really interested in this question about what's possible with these mobile devices. Right. This was the first first devices that went beyond the flip phone. They had a screen, that touch interface. Yes. And so now, you, for the first time, you could envision more professional applications, not just telephoning and text messaging. And so that's something I explore with my um, with the real-time graphics. So I realized, hey, there is something possible. You can actually really drive 3D graphics on these devices, even you know, mm -hmm. about at a slow pace, but you could. And so um, I realized that um, if going back to Germany and joining my father's business would be a great way to explore that further. Um, and that's what we did. We created a small team to start then building um, a mobile CAD package. A mobile CAD package. Now, but then you went to Stanford after London. So, no, I, I actually went to work for um, eight years. Eight years before, wow. So I, I left academia completely, went to work, 
um, explored some of these topics mobile. Uh, we then did a big project of re rethinking our, how our desktop cat should look like, the next generation of that. Mm. Um, that's something I, I, I worked on for quite a number of years, so building out a team to support that. And then um, as part of COVID actually, um, this conference, um, we got in touch with one of the professors at Stanford who was um, looking at the intersection of, um, um, of civil engineering and computation. Like how can you use computational methods to, to drive change in the civil engineering field? Martin Fisher um, at SciFi, um, which is the Center for Integrated Facility Engineering. Mm -hmm. And um, we basically start talking about different topics that could be interesting. And over two or three years, having those conversations, we realized maybe it's the best would be for me to kind of join the PhD program. Um, and I did that in 2009. Okay, okay, okay. So then, now, then, before we get to the PhD program, so when what, what, what were some of these in 2000 when you're putting together this team um, at Graeber? What are you guys doing with CAD on mobile? Of course, the computation is so much less, the power so much less, sure. and the graphical capability so much less back then. But. So, yes, so we first have obviously looked at sort of visualization and, um, and markup. So one of the things we uh, developed was the ability to embed voice messages into drawings. So you take your drawing outside, yeah. you embed a voice message saying, I, you know, you don't want to write it down, you don't have time, so you just make a voice message instead of it being a WhatsApp, whatever, mm -hmm. it was actually embedded in the design. Okay. So not only does it have you know, your notes, but also has context and where exactly it was referring to. The same for pictures, and that was, 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 was one use case. The other use case was really data collection. And so we had uh, partners that would build, uh, for example, GPS tracking software. We embedded the software in heavy machinery in the, in the construction field where there were just terminals, and um, we would use a mobile cat to really capture what was being uh, done in the field. And the product that we built ourselves was really all around this idea of very efficient on-site um, plan production of drawings of existing buildings. Because owners have this problem that you know they design a building, maybe the designs are even lost, but the building changes over time. You need to capture what's actually there, either for rental purposes, for um, fire safety. We did lots of works in the, in the UK with um, big retail brands, we did it with the prison authority because they just really need to get have up-to-date plans. Um, and so that was sort of a part of our business that we've always kept working on um, because it was an ideal use case for mobile CAD. Okay, okay. So, so one, one, of the, one of the things is, you know, when you're looking at, at CAD's capabilities back in 2000, you're thinking mm -hmm. about how to augment it, make it more effective for both on a communication level between people that are working on the same project, as well as make it more efficient for the environments that it's being put into, like construction, um, and leveraging already some of the new, newer technologies like sensor technologies, GPS. Sure. So what were, you know, you, and then you kept teaching us that you were doing more of this work in trying to add on to the, onto CAD. So then, D did it seem like there was something that was like sticking as you were adding things into CAD to make it a better tool? What were the things that were that you were seeing most people were wanting to see CAD to get better at? I think what we actually realized is that the CAD is an interesting underlying fundamental technology ready to create these designs, but th we weren't necessarily working with CAD users. Right, the CAD user is a typical person that sits in the office and you know works with a large screen. The person that's in the field is not a CAD user typically. It's mm. a surveyor. It is a um, maybe somebody that's not that skilled in, in you know desktop computers. Um, and so we had to really rethink how we actually interact, how the user interacts with the product, make it much more workflow driven than you know this open set of 500 features that any, you can use in any order. No, you have to go through step from one to ten. We've evolved that product line actually over the last years into even more sort of specific, specific niches. And one of those that we have today is the, the kitchen survey market. So it's a market where um, in Germany, you, uh, the customer would go to kitchen studio, design his kitchen with the a, with a seller, um, but they won't produce it until they've actually gone out to verify that the measure, they would actually fit as details about where is the, where, where are the outlets? How's the windowsill position? What kind of materials are we looking at? We, 
And um, so we would build a specialized solution and somebody who is a trained um, kitchen salesperson has no problem picking up the software, understanding what is required of him, what measurements does he have to take. Um, so fundamentally it's still CAD, but it's, it's so much more of a workflow driven tool. And this is what we've seen always from the beginning. CAD is really uh, like a fundamental building block for a lot of engineering software where um, the idea is you're presenting geometry or you have, um, and through the specific applications you derive meaning what that geometry actually represents. Is it a screw? Is it a wall? Is it you know, something very different? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why so much engineering software builds on top of CAD. Yeah, when 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 you're when you're you're walking us through this this really interesting realization about how when someone's behind the computer that is making the 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 CAD, then what ends up happening is the the person in the field is typically not someone that's making CAD. The person sure. in the field is so. Then you have to have this degree of 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 relatability for the person in the field to be able to use CAD in a way that at least visually that makes sense. And then there's this whole, that becomes this communication process. And what then, um, what then was your big, um, you know, you, t you talked about the Stanford professor that helped you um, get moving into your, into your PhD program. What was that, you know, what was that fire under you that sparked you to also go and start studying? The well, I, I was obviously interested in kind of exploring some questions a little bit further that, you know, in an economic you know, a business context, it's a little bit harder to to keep asking the why question. Uh, at some point, you're going to deliver a product that you can sell to customers, right? Um, and so it was interesting as a completely different environment to understand, to drive a little bit deeper. And so I thought, you know, my first conception when I arrived at Sanford was like, okay, I'm going to take this building surveying specific question and I really drive a little bit deeper on that. But through sort of successive why questions, um, we ended up with a very different, or I ended up with a very different PhD, because I said, okay, well, why do we even measuring this, right? So the first question is, why, why, why do you care about the data? Um, so then one of the use cases we thought, okay, could be for energy efficiency or energy management. You want to understand how efficient is this space. So then we started looking at, okay, well, how precise does the data need to be for it to actually make a difference in the energy calculation, right? So what degrees of precision uh, are we looking for? Is it centimeters, me meters? And you find out very quickly that the, the, the geometry really can vary by quite a lot for it not to have a significant I impact on the energy. So then the question is, why do we even go out to, to measure this? Um, and then the question was, well, why do we even want to do an energy model, right? Why would you want to, what, what's interesting in that? And well, then you can say, well, maybe I have a goal of reducing the efficiency. Um, and then I kept doing this and then we kind of realized there's not really a uniform approach to doing energy management I, I, you know, in the corporate real estate specifically. I picked corporate real estate for one point because it was large enough that actual energy efficiency could make a big dollar difference, right? If you save 10% on a you know, million dollar bill, you're saving money. Um, but it's also close enough to the core of, the, of sort of the management of the company so that's visible enough that they could say, well, maybe it's useful for us to do so. And so I started studying different companies um, across the US um, and I realized there's really very high degrees of professionalism uh, or there are different degrees of professionalism in, in that industry today. There's even a challenge of have, using this, the correct terminology or the same terminology. And so I ended up really thinking about what are the methods that exist today, what are the methods that potentially could make sense and do the tools that are available really serve the industry well. Um, and so I ended up, I, go, I started with saying, I want to measure spaces to basically saying, well, we don't really understand, we need to first understand, we have to first generate a common language and a common practices around how we're going to deal with all this data that we're producing. And so from a very sort of technical starting point, we ended up with something that fundamentally was really about talking to people and understanding how they work today. Yeah, the, the idea of take, taking a look at something that seems to be a very common uh, theme, like a, a commercial building and being able to see it through a lens of how can I make it better. And not only how can I make the tools better for the engineers and designers, but also how can I make it more energy efficient. These are very important things to pass along with the, with the, with the way of thinking to, to younger people. How can I make things better than when I look around me? How can I design them to be better? So then did you end up um, experiencing success with, um, with, with 
with changing the design of buildings in order to decrease the amount of uh, cost of energy? Well, I think, uh, I think the point I was trying to make is that um, my realization is just simply to quantify is the building efficient is a very complicated question. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second question is certain tools in the market are supposed to help you understand is your building efficient? Um, but also, is it building more efficient than it was previously? So you've changed, you've changed the, the, the windows potentially, you changed the lights, right? Yeah, yeah. Is your building actually more efficient? And do you have a good tool for, for helping you understand that? And that's actually an un, not a very well addressed problem at this point. So Even like energy expenditure. So you can look at energy expenditure, but there's variable factors that impact that, right? Weather, occupancy. Um, among other things, opening hours, etc. But year to year, you can see that in like June of 2018 versus June of 2019, that that's usually similar weather. Well, yeah. it, it, that so yes, so the so we're getting into, it's a little bit into the weeds right now, yes, but yes. Um, these are also interesting weeds yeah. though, that yeah, we're yeah, like yeah. unpacking. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the, so you typically use a uh, normalization for that, right? You say. Um, this year we had this many heating degree days and this year we maybe might have had a different number so we don't want to normalize for that because we don't want to just look at the bare consumption we want to look at consumption normalizing for weather mm -hmm. right but then we want to look at normalizing for weather and occupancy yeah because you may have gained employment by 10 or yeah, and you might people. and then the question is okay now let's put uh, an example I add a 10% staff mm -hmm. means the HVAC is running extra hours to mm -hmm. just kind of cool us down mm -hmm. is that the building managers fault uh, right. <laughs> so, so these are these are these are real questions, right? Saying, what are you interested in? What are you interested in measuring? Are you tr interested in measuring? Oh, interesting. Because so then, do you measure per person then? Ex yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. These are all relevant. These are all sort of questions you need to ask yourself. What your en end goal is? If your end goal is to get a plaque um, <laughs> on the on the wall, which is what some people want to do, they want to they want to show that they care about the energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. They want to have an energy star plaque or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, or is your goal to, you know, figure out what, how an efficient building in your organization should look like, or do you want to figure out um, the big picture designs of the future? Yeah, and so th there's a lot of, um, we ended up doing, realizing that why people do these things, why people actually invest in energy efficiency, they do it for very many, for different reasons. We had some companies that were, um, that we studied that really cared about the dollars. They wanted to save mm -hmm. dollars. And if they could um, um, you know, get a two-year return on a lighting retrofit, let's do it. That's a gateway to invest our money. But some companies that really only cared about the messaging to customers or their own uh, employees. Yeah, Saying, yeah. look, we take care of this. We care about the environment just as you do. And we're going to take care of this uh, one example of the space you're in. Yeah. And we have other companies that wanted to show excellence. Um, uh, it was a um, custodian bank, and they were. It's really hard for them to to show their customers that they are very deliberate and thoughtful in how um, they, you know, approach business. And one way they could show it is by being very considerate about how they manage um, processes around the buildings. And one of those was how do we keep ever being uh, more efficient in there. So, the simple question where you say, "Well, we're going to save us money." Is, is is too simple yeah yeah and so that was part of the yeah. research like it was Correct. again i was really i came from a computer science background my interest was how do i capture space efficiently how do i capture energy efficiently yeah. without ne without stepping back saying why do we want to do this right and and that's sort of mm -hmm. like part of the joy of a phd is that you get kept getting these questions and you're like well i don't know let me go find out and, mm -hmm. and you keep doing that until you get to a point where you say, well, I think I've reached a point where there's no consensus here, so maybe it's worthwhile to study this part first before we even go down all the way and saying, well, what are the right tools for measuring buildings? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's cool that you bring up how the different um, people have different um, ways of perceiving the way that they are energy efficient. Some people, like you said, get a plaque. Some people tell their employees. Some people tell their customers. Some people want to potentially build the next generation of gardens on the rooftops, solar panels on the rooftops, complete water recycling systems. Sure. 
all this kind of crazy things and composting the food in the garden, all this crazy stuff that is fascinating and that could potentially, um, but yeah, how do you measure it for all of the variables? This is, this is really good, good stuff. Um, okay, when you're, when, you're, when, when you're doing that and then you're finding yourself moving, um, you're, you're still doing work with um, Graber while you're doing um, the finishing up the, the, the PhD and, and co coming back to Boston? Sure. Yeah? So, you know, um, of course, the Graber, the business continued, um, you know, and one of the things we did during that time was quite asking ourselves again, how do people want to use our software, right? I we talked about the desktop user um, really being sort of somebody who spends a lot of time with CAD, but realizing that it actually is, CAD to some degree is, is, is also, you know, a, a communication tool, right? Same as documents are a communication tool. And how do we make that, again, available to more people in an organization? And so um, with the uh, arrival of iOS and Android, and we then brought on, we bought new mobile CAD systems onto those devices again, so somebody who's up out in the construction site or out somebody who's on the shop, shop floor mm -hmm. can take the designs with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, um, actually another COFIS conversation uh, a couple of years ago led to us working on a full cloud-based CAD system, right? And again, main driver for that isn't necessarily say, cool, we can do it. It's more about, well, how do we access that user who's not gonna install that you know, big install of, of CAD software, get licensing and all that, make, all, all that set up. You know, how do we, can we how can I get, share a design with you so you can comment on it, that you can review and give me feedback on without me having to set up something very complicated, right? Yeah. And sending out a PDF serves that to some degree, but I have no way of getting that back if I don't want you to give that to you anymore. I have no, um, I have very little control of the experience you're going to have while you're viewing that, and so. Those are the things we can, I, you know, uh, I was part of, you know, moving that forward, even during the PhD, but of course in a much reduced role, um, as that was really my focus. And then, what, what, were, what have you been seeing then in, in CAD and in building surveying over the last, what has it been, 10 years since the PhD? I finished uh, 2015 or 16, so recently, a couple of years Three ago. years, three yeah. years, yeah, yeah, since PhD. So what has it been like in the last, you know, three years when you've been doing some of the, um, some more of the building surveying and CAD at the cutting edge? What have you been seeing? Um, so CAD, you know, when is quite diversified in what kind of tools we're using. Um, so AEC computer aided design versus mechanical um, versus sort of what we traditionally do, which is sort of, you know, we call it two D CAD, but it's actually two D and three D, but they're all slightly different paradigms, and we do see a lot of that growing together, right? And you know, you see more and more design happening in in tools like uh, Revit, um, SolidWorks, uh, sort of to name just two leading products. But there's still a need to communicate again. So yeah. our type of tool, which are drawing, really drawing tools, um, to have that as a documentation and legal contract and also a communication tool uh, continues to be relevant, but it becomes more and more relevant to be able to consume and work with that other content. Um, you were teaching me about this earlier, just that all of these platforms have their own uh, exporting, their own system. They, they all have their own formats. They all sort of um, traditionally have proprietary uh, file formats, but there's bigger push by the users to say, hey, we got to figure out how to collaborate here yeah, and how yeah, to get yeah, the different yeah. functions of a business to work together. And so I think it's quite an interesting time. We've had you know, this cloud shift now happening for the last five years. And this is, used to be leading industry. It's sort of a little bit more laggard simply because of the large install base of the sort of traditional desktop applications. But we're trying to also enable some of our partners who currently are finding it a little bit hard to kind of um, move to the cloud and mobile to, like, with our tools to make that a little bit easier. Because we do believe in the in the in the potential for enhanced capabilities there. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so assisting some of your clients to make the transition to to cloud, and then is there also a a is there a specific CAD tool that you find maximizes collaborative capability? Well, I don't want to. So there's obviously. Everybody's trying to solve that problem in some way or form, right? Traditionally, if you look at the mechanical CAD space, you know, you use something like uh, the PDM systems of the world, where 
you know, you, all the data would be managed in one place, but only one person could check out that data at one point and work with that, right? That's inherently limiting because um, if you and I want to ma make changes to the same part, we, it's not possible, right? Um, and there was a lot of pain points there, um, and we're seeing more and more systems now move towards sort of a more database type approach where everybody can make changes and they all flow together into one sort of master repository. And it's more in the mechanical space today, excuse me, um, and less in the AC space, but I see it there also coming now. So those sort of common data um, arc, um, environments where people all publish their data together. And I think that fundamentally changes the collaboration game because now I'm no longer limited by um, you know single access. We can all access together. Yeah. Our solutions, for example, today um, already include abilities to share view-only links that you know not only give you access to the design, but they also are live. So whatever, if I make a change, even after I've shared the, the design with you, you'll see the live version right away. And I think it's super powerful just to um, ease, never having to worry about, am I looking at the latest or mm -hmm. am I looking at version 56, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's just, um, it, it gets enabled by cloud um, mostly, just the idea that you're no longer passing on files. You, you basically have a central repository and we're all looking at the same truth. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, the, ce the central repository seems to be the, uh, like one of the main ways to make sure that the collaboration is always at the final that you're always collaborating on the final product, on the, on the, at the edge. And then what about with, um, with, with building surveying sure. on that side of things? So building surveying for us, um, I think the main change is now, it used to be that you know, we'd, we would go out, um, or our clients would go out, we, we really focused on selling that software, would go out and create a, a DWG, so a classic drawing file. Uh, what we're seeing difference now in the kitchen serving market, they don't care about that, they want the kitchen design to come back in whatever planning software they're using. So it's the DWG is sort of a nice intermediate, but they really care about, okay, what does it mean? What, what kind of cabinet do you need or what size, right? Um, and we're finding that um, now with the, the sort of prevalence of BIM and 3D tools in the AC space, more and more clients want to say, hey, uh, we need a BIM model so that we can provide our potential tenants or potential buyers a 3D virtual walkthrough uh, walk environment. And so the, the needs have changed a little bit over time. And this is a major part of, of potential like virtual and augmented reality experiences, these walkthroughs in the building environments. So this, that, that seems to be a, a reoccurring theme from some of the clients that you work with is that they want to, to be able to enter into their building surveying with the tools. It, it really depends on what, um, what your goals are, right? Um, I think for a professional to look at a drawing file, it's very easy to interpret, okay, this is a window, this is a, this is a door, right? You know, you kind of, even if you're not too familiar, you kind of understand what the symbology means, but this, uh, it gets very technical very quickly. Like this is, um, this is like a socket or this is, you know, um, lighting fixture, for example. Uh, a 3D environment is, is, is richer in that it actually makes it extremely obvious how to navigate the space and what the, the symbols mean because it's just it's a much closer representation of our real world. That's right. right? Yeah, yeah. And so depending on who your audience is, like if you say I wanna I wanna use instead of giving a potential tenant just a floor plan, I'm gonna give them, you know, a 3D model that they can spin, they can slice, they can look at, it gives them much better sense, okay, what is the scale of this properties. If you do a mashup with you know one of the furniture vendors and say, well, how would that look if I put a bat in here, right? And so they are, um, it just opens, it's sort of, a get, if without that, it's really hard to do virtual reality and augmented reality. Yeah, yeah. But if you have that, you can then give people a way to experience the space in a much more complete way that with a 2D design, it's, it's just so much interpretive there that it's hard to do that. What are you most looking forward to engineering software converging and moving towards? I think, um, on the engineering side, I would say that the, you know, we've seen some first um, developments with Onshape and Fusion 360 and other cloud-based mechanical CAD systems mm. that you know, they're starting to unlock some of those you know, collaborative and other features through the cloud. And I think it's just such a key turning uh, like, um, thing you can do to change what kind of software you can architect 
that um, I think we're going to see in the next five to ten years many more solutions jumping on that and then finally unlocking some of the capabilities. You know, some of the very obvious things is rendering and simulation because that's a very easy thing to parallelize and send out. Yeah. But a lot of this, the, the core design solutions are still desktop, you know, single user, um, single threading even uh, working. And you know those solutions will hopefully get modernized, and 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 I think that will lead to another level of um, productivity. You know, we we talked at this conference a lot about generative design, but it, that's sort of a, a more advanced design mechanism that's only really possible through um, you know um, working with the cloud and having sort of a very highly scalable computational resource at your disposal. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully that gets democratized to more people around the world. It's definitely looking like it's going in that direction. La well, uh, but back yeah. uh, yes and no, right? Yes, yeah. as in it's it's now accessible. Like you don't no longer have to build your own yeah. uh, data center. But also in a way, no, because now the the quality of the design really depends to some degree on how much you're willing to spend on the compute for it. Oh, yeah, right? sure, sure. That's there's that side of it too. So yeah. yes, I think overall the trend is definitely positive, and obviously compute gets ever cheaper and ever more affordable. That's a good point. Um, but um, it's no longer you know what can I come up with, but how much am I willing to spend on it? D yeah, yeah. That has been a, a trend of, of, of the rise of civilization, that the more money that you can sometimes spend on something, the higher of a quality that that product can be, that then can go out into the market and make, more, make you more money. Yeah. And then last question is, what would you say is an important skill for kids and their parents to develop in the 21st century? What is an important skill? I found what has been my, sort of my um, driver, at least, and I'm not sure how well that translate, but it's really been a, a curiosity for technology. How does it work? And you know, I was always trying to play around with these things and exp exposing myself, continue to expose myself to new um, software and also machinery, just to really um, be sort of flexible and, under and being able to, you know, be comfortable in all of those things and. I found this is also a way, even now, as you say, your, your starting points were 18 years now in, in this business, uh, it's a way to keep fresh and uh, even, even beyond being a child, like how do you, how does it still be, be interesting as well by trying to do new things all the time, but trying to yeah. keep it fresh, right? And um, I think it's, it comes natural to, I think, nearly all kids is yeah. to, to wander about the world and, you know, Definitely. just let them, let them try things out. Yeah, yeah. You heard it here first. Keep it fresh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for coming on the show, Robert. Thank really you. appreciate it. It's been really enlightening. There's a lot to still learn and unpack. Check out the links below for Robert's work. Also, check out the links below to Kofes. Also, give us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you about what we talked about in this conversation. Go share it with other people as well. Support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. You can find all of Simulation's links below. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.